Good afternoon and welcome to the first webinar of our second series of Fit for the New Future. Um, we had a week off last week delivering uh, our webinars, so we're raring to go today. Just as a uh, an arrival activity, really, and just whilst we're waiting for people to enter, have a look at the question on the screen. So what are you most looking forward to once all year groups are back at school? If you just want to pop your answer in the chat box, we'll try and pick some out as we go. Hopefully it'll be a nice positive start to the webinar. See what people are looking forward to. See some nice hellos going in, always nice and polite. Yeah, hearing about their home learning experience is brilliant. Yeah, that'd be really interesting to hear what they've been up to. Yeah, being back together and 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 into our new normal, that'd be really interesting. Love that one. I think I just saw around their smiles, seeing the children smile again. And hopefully they will be once they've seen all their friends and, and their teachers again. It's going really fast. Yeah, being back with them again, spending time with them, reconnecting with them. Brilliant. <laughs> yeah, starting to try like non-contact games and, and socially distanced PE. An interesting experience for us all. Fantastic. Okay. So I'm just going to now uh, pop a poll up on the screen for you, just so we can start to see um, what kind of situation you're currently in. What's it like in your context? So is your school currently open? Hopefully that's popping up onto your screen. And hopefully within the poll tab, you'll be able to see the, the live results of, of the poll. So it's heavily weighted more towards yes, that schools are currently open. 70-30 at the moment in favour of yes. Interesting. Fantastic. Brilliant. Yeah, so currently at 90% yes, they're open. Uh, 31% currently saying no. Brilliant. Okay. I'm just going to close that poll now, guys. Thank you very much for completing that. So, uh, welcome to, to this webinar. This is the first one of the second series of Fit for the New Future. Today is going to be a, a focus on the key points and the key reflections from series one. Um, and just before we start, we're just going to do a little bit of um, housekeeping. So please be aware that this workshop is being recorded. Uh, please use the chat box function to ask any questions throughout or answer any questions. Please be respectful in there and use professional language. Uh, and then the presentation handouts and certificates are going to be available to download at the end, which I will signpost you to. Today's webinar will last around an hour. And so uh, I've got an, an excellent lineup for you today. Uh, hopefully, if you've seen the previous webinars, you'd have met um, our PE coordinators before. So we have Sharon and Mark from the South region. We have Ryan from the North and myself, Tom, from the West. So um, throughout this webinar, I'd just like to ask if you could be as present as possible. I know it can be quite tough in certain situations. And be as present as this lovely lady that you can see on the bottom left of, of your screen. Um, we're actually going to encourage you as much to, to use the chat box, fun, uh, chat box fun, function throughout. Uh, and please enter any key questions or themes that spring to mind. Hopefully at the end, we're going to have a chance to revisit those and, and respond to them. Like I said before, this is going to be um, 
a reflection of series one and picking out the key themes. And this is going to work uh, by working alongside my colleagues. So they're going to be reflecting on the key points from each webinar, which you can see on your screen. And then uh, I'm going to ask them a couple of questions that have come through the pre-webinar form that you guys have kindly completed. And there's been some really, really good questions in there. Like I said before, if there's anything that comes to mind throughout the webinar, please feel free to uh, post it in the chat box and we'll try and address it as best as we can. And just before we dive in, um, please be aware that we're not here to declare what you should do in PE. Um, you must follow the, the government, national and local education authority guidance, as well as any school specific rules. Um, really, the aim of this webinar is to help promote some thought, some discussion and reflection on what might work in your environment and in your context. And that's really going to be different for everybody on this webinar. I will provide you a link uh, towards the end, if you haven't seen it, of the COVID-19 guidance for educational settings and key workers um, off from the AFPI website. So let's dive in. Um, I can already see you there smiling, which is great to see. I'd like to invite Hi, Sharon. Um, Sharon's just going to provide us a recap of the very first webinar, Beyond the Physical, which Sharon feels like a good while ago now. Yes, uh, oh, nearly five weeks now, I think. And uh, how we've moved along already from that time when we were experiencing the new normal of then. So yeah, beyond the physical. So for those of you who I have seen that some of you um, didn't see the first series, it's just a quick recap. But actually, as Mark has put into the column now, we have got an on-demand YouTube link that we'll share with you at the end of the of the um, webinar today. So what was beyond the physical about? Can we remember? Yes, the first thing that we looked at was really revisiting what does the national curriculum mean to us when we have to come and deliver it? How do we interpret this as teachers so that it really does develop what we want to develop amongst our children? And it's pretty much looking at how can we develop our children to have a love of learning and movement. And as you can see there, those children are fully engaged. They are sat down and not moving, but they're, they're doing the E bit of the PE, aren't they? So let's think about how can we um, help these develop that love of movement going forward. And last week when we looked at reconnecting through PE, and we spoke to Lewis and Andy from their schools in Manila. They were a little bit more forward uh, ahead, rather, in their developments with the school. And they were starting to get back to a, a sort of new normal. And they were saying that they perceived the children as we're, they're superheroes because every child is a superhero to a teacher. We see all their strengths. We see all their gifts and we want to develop them. But just like any superhero, if they're really strong, we need to make sure they have that empathy. And that's where we can really carve that four corner model into our curriculum to be the thread with which enables us to focus on how we can develop each child to develop their physical literacy, but making sure the E in PE, the education, the social, the psychological, holistic part is very much embedded in what we do. So just so that we can recap on that, we're going to turn to my colleagues, uh, Amanda and Ben, and they're going to give us a little example, a little breakdown of what holistic development can look like in your curriculum. Hang on a moment. Sorry about this, everyone. Thank you. Here we go. Holistic child development in primary PE. The purpose of PE is to contribute to the holistic development of the child. Good morning, children. How are we? Hi. We're gonna do some fun PE this morning. Nice. Oh. 
Holistic development is important in PE because we don't just want to develop children's physical skills, but also the subject is really important for developing children's social skills, how they might communicate with each other, and also how might they might solve problems within games. What are you doing right now, which is really, really nice? Discussing it. But how are you discussing it? Is everybody talking at the same time? So quiet voices. Letting people talk. Brilliant. It might be that we're looking to work the children physically, so we have a bit more of a focus in that area, so we can pull out different aspects in the sessions that we're delivering. So we've got two pieces of equipment going at the same time. Really like that, well done. Let's see it in action. We introduced equipment into arm tennis to increase the level of difficulty, so we went from a football to a tennis ball um, to refine the motor skills that children were learning. I'm going to challenge you, can you play with a tennis ball instead of the football? OK, there you go, thank you very much. The Four Corner Model is the FA's approach to developing the whole child. The Four Corner Model consists of a technical and tactical corner, a physical corner, a social corner and a psychological corner. We have the four separate corners uh, to ensure that when we're delivering sessions that we are thinking about all the different areas that are important for holistic development of children. It's one of those lessons that we can really bring out the teamwork aspect, the communication skills that other lessons in school don't have the opportunity to do. Learning in PE should be planned. A good way to consider this is to create a medium term plan for each term or half term of PE lessons. Here is an example of what a simple key stage two medium term plan could look like. In this term, the plan has four central aims, a technical and physical focus around defending and a psychosocial focus on working together to evaluate success. All of these areas are chosen from the PE national curriculum the needs of the pupils will determine how much time and focus there will be in each corner. This kind of medium term plan helps ensure holistic development happens and helps teachers to plan lessons that link together and build and embed key skills. So as you hopefully that sort of brought you back up to speed with what holistic development can really mean and some of the questions we asked uh, when we went through beyond the physical last time was what did you notice about the teachers in the delivery were they telling the children what to do were they involving the children in the decision making and it's, these are just things that we, we still need to consider when we go forward now, even though we have got far more stringent controls for their safety, is there still an opportunity for um, children's voice and choice? And uh, Tom's back with us now. Brilliant. Thank you, Sharon, for the, for the recap. And thank you, everybody, for popping your answers into the, the chat box. Um, so, Sharon, I've just got a couple of questions that I'd like to ask you that have been sent in from the, the viewers. First one's a, a, a nice, tough one to start off. Um, so, how do you change the P curriculum to serve the holistic needs of the children when the maybe the leadership team wants a sports-specific model or curriculum? Mm -hmm. Yeah, really good question. Um, culture change is, is not an easy thing to do, but it's not an impossible thing to do, as you know. And, and you being teachers, and most probably the best people are influencing to have a love of learning and a love of listening because of all the strategies you develop with your children. But predominantly, I think the first thing you need to do is sort of get senior leadership team to trust you and explain using the four corners that we've shown and shared with you over the weeks to demonstrate how you can sort of um, ignite that love of learning across all four corners through a multi sort of multi skill based curriculum. Uh, the other thing is staff meetings. Can you through staff meetings maybe do some upskilling and, and it might be an opportunity for a 30 minute um, sort of presentation or even a practical and P coordinators are quite happy to come in and support you in this in your schools to try and help you change the mindsets of those teachers um, in the staff room and the SLT as a whole. The other thing is put 
again, putting together some, some statistics to show how it can actually help attainment, create a more community, uh, a community sense of belonging for that school. And also how, your, how the values of the school can really be aligned to what you want to deliver in PE. Um, so to drive, I suppose in short, to really drive that change, it does need you to develop that strong positive connection with the senior leadership team and going in there prepared with the why, because they want to know why change it if it's worked for them when they were younger. And so you need to make sure, you know, you've got that detail. So possibly talking to um, whoever your regional coordinator is in PE and linking in as well with, with your local Premier League Primary Stars Club. That's fantastic. Thank you, Sharon. I think the big theme there is connection. Uh, and probably yeah. go back into the school and revisiting those connections with, with staff. Um, and uh, there's some bits in the chat I can just see around all the CPD that people may have managed to, to do during this time and possibly picking out some key bits that you want to um, demonstrate within school and, and help educate the staff that you work with. That's really important. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, and Tom, even, it could be that you pilot it, you know, if they want to see yeah. what and impact in your school maybe you pilot it with one or two teachers or a particular year group who you feel have that real holistic need at the moment um which i invariably think is all of them but you know i am an advocate if you're trying to influence it maybe that you need to focus on one aspect first brilliant so i've got a second question for you sharon if you don't mind um mm -hmm. when the children come back to school how yeah. can PE help them progress holistically? Yeah, that is, that's a really good question. I mean, I think PE can be the real, the real vehicle, really, for that to happen. Um, but I, I suppose the first thing is about coming back is about what a lot of people have said they've spent the day doing, actually, in this week, in reconnecting with their, with their students. So I think there's most probably three sort of principles I would look at, and it would be to reconnect with the pupils, re-establish the routines and protocols for safe PE according to your AFP guidance, your YST delivery principles, and most importantly, the leadership team and your local education authority, because every location has different needs and a different situation evolving every day. Um, and then, so that would be reconnect, ask the children what they've done. Some might have taken part in loads of physical activity. They may have had a trampoline, they may have been on it every day, they may have been in the parks, um, but there may be others, and, but they haven't had anyone to play with or talk with or share with. So they've lost all those real social skills. And then you're gonna have the other sort of half who maybe haven't been out all day, but have been on PlayStation communicating with everybody through games. So there are going to be different needs and there are going to be different aspects of the four corner model that maybe there needs to be further emphasis on for those individuals. Um, but remember to ask the children, you know, give them that voice. We can't allow them to do everything they want to do, but we can find ways. It's good for them to feel and recognize that we are listening to them because, you know, they've been away from us for so long. Uh, re-establish the routines that's for you so you don't feel vulnerable um, so that you know exactly what's happening they know exactly what's happening you know what it's like when you go back to school first week back after half term a lot of the routines are sometimes forgotten it's about reiterating them following them getting that into practice um, because you know they must probably haven't had a routine many of them for quite a long time now and then it's about, and I think this is the real important one, it's about that rejuvenation, the rejuvenation of your PE lessons. How, how are you going to get them to explore movements whilst maintaining social distancing? And how can, comp, how can they compete now? And does competition have to be against another person or can it be about personal bests and improving on their scores each week? Um, how can you encourage teamwork if we can't play in teams? Could it be that scores or they have to find different ways of communicating the letters they have under their own cones or in their own areas to spell a word as a group? 
So it's just thinking about how we can still give that ownership to children um, because they really, and we do need to talk about you're my bubble or you're my team because they need to feel that sense of belonging. I think that's really important and something that's been really stressed by the recovery curriculum is that that sense of belonging may have been lost. And now that they're back in school, I imagine a lot of them, even though some may feel slightly anxious, they're very excited. Um, and I hope that answers the question. I don't know if yeah. you have anything, Tom. There's, there's lots of things in there, and I was just trying to note down stuff while she was talking. Three things for me that I'm going to take away. Reconnect, yeah. reestablish, and rejuvenate. Yeah. yeah really good stuff. thank you sharon thank you very much um, yeah and can i just quickly say tom it's just really good because oh, yeah. yeah that this week they've been able to reconnect through pp it's been invaluable teachers have also expressed the positivity so that that's wonderful carly well done you and your and your school thank you brilliant thank you sharon um so now i'm going to invite ryan in to review some of the key points from our webinar engaging pupils in pe before ryan starts i've got a very quick poll for you um so those that did watch the first series you're going to be a bit bit ahead on this but if you didn't watch it give it a go so during the webinar engaging pupils in pe which animal did paul quinn refer a lot to or refer to a lot <laughs> Okay, so we've got some responses flying in, Ryan. Interesting. Bit of a spread currently. Definitely one of those so questions, watching. if you know, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very true. Very true. A couple more seconds then, guys, if you can get your response in. Uh, see, I think we've got quite a few on. That watch series one or they're really good guessing one of the two definitely got some regulars with us today tom it's good to see <laughs> it is it is brilliant well thank you for responding to the poll guys i'm just gonna close it up now you're right the majority are right so alpaca was the animal that paul quinn talked a lot about and i just want to ask ryan has that made your slide today ryan uh, I'm I'm very sorry, uh, Tom. I'm actually going to disappoint all the alpaca fans who tuned in just for that today. I'm afraid. Uh, <laughs> Paul uh, Paul is starting his own podcast though, Al Alpaca Weekly. So you can uh, you can tune in for that if you want your alpaca fix. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, pleasure to be to be with you again today, and and thank you very much for uh, joining us for the first time or, or rejoining us after series one. Uh, like Sharon, I thought just before just before I take some questions on on the topic of engaging pupils. I thought it'd be uh, a really good idea just to recap some of the, the key messages that we talked about in the webinar and, and also give an insight to the to the content for those who weren't able to join us for series one, but might want to go back on, on the YouTube channel and, um, uh, and, and look at some of the things that we talked about. So I'd probably describe this overview as some of our core principles around engaging, around engaging pupils in PE. And I think that top one, other than safety, is probably our top priority when it comes to PE in primary school. You know, how can we make it as an enjoyable experience as possible so that the children are looking forward to their next PE lesson, which I, I always think is a, a really good gauge as to, as to how well the lesson's gone if they can't wait for their next PE lesson. And I suppose the other four points below that you can see on your screen are, are some of the ways that we can start to do that. And that managing difference, that, that second point is is a really big topic. Uh, we're going to touch on it today a little bit, but we're going to have a much deeper dive into it uh, in coming, coming webinars. So I'll give you some more information uh, about that as we go along. That third one is a big one, you know, using games. And I don't just mean games with a ball and, and, and two goals, but tag games, 1v1 games, individual games, which might be prevalent going forward at this time, but games with a purpose linked to the, to the learning outcome. You know whether that is a physical outcome or, or a social outcome a psychological outcome and th these games just allow, allow for more activity time and, and more enjoyment as opposed to those traditional maybe line based drills where you might have six six pupils waiting in a line and for their turn and and then we wonder why they might start misbehaving probably because the board and 
and just want to be playing, you know, which might be the natural instinct as a child. And I think in, in, can we start to incorporate into those games that point I've got down as number four, which is the, the pupil's interest as a hook. And we talked about this a lot on the webinar, you know, engaging them with their interests, whether that is, you know, key stage one, pretending to be part of Paw Patrol as you're playing some games in PE or um, building some learning objectives around maybe their role models in key stage two, whether that's Harry Potter, Serena Williams, whoever that might be. And, you know, in my, in my experience of teaching, that's, that can be one of the most powerful tools for engaging pupils. And I think I used the example in the webinar of a Lion King game, a Lion King game I played with a school uh, year two class in Middlesbrough last year and using toy lions and a lion roar on the speakers. And, you know, it really captivated them and, and could be so powerful. And that last point, you know, being a PE role model, I don't think we can underestimate the power you have as the, as the teacher to be that PE role model. And for me, that starts with, you know, being looking the part and being in being in a tracksuit or a PE kit when you're delivering PE. And, you know, I referred to on the webinar that I know there's time constraints around that, but it just sets a precedent for the PE lesson and shows that, you know, how, how highly you value PE and being that role model and someone that they can look up to. So that, that's just a brief overview of the webinar. And um, like I said, you know, if, if you didn't get a chance to see the first webinar back at the beginning of May, then it is available on the YouTube link that we'll give you at the end to go back and have a look at. So I understand, Tom, for, for those who did tune in, in series one, there were some questions that have come in around the content of engaging pupils in PE. Yes, Ryan, can you hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you loud and clear, Tom, yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, yeah, so again, some really good questions from, from your webinar. Um, and this is probably a question to start us off that we've all considered at some point in our career. Um, how can we meet the needs of and engage all pupils in a class containing a wide range of abilities? It's a, a fantastic question. I think one that highlights, like you've said, one of the biggest challenges we have in delivering PE in primary schools, where you've got that class of, of 30 students and you've got your county netballers academy footballers at one end of the spectrum at the other end you might have those students who you know lack confidence in PE and get nervous when a ball might come near them and, and then we've got everything in between also add into the mix that we've probably got a piano in the corner a, a stage out we've got things hanging from the roof we've got a tiny tiny hole we're working in and you know that can be a, it can be a massive challenge this you know this question of, of differentiation and managing difference is something that we did touch upon on in the engaging pupils webinar and it's something that paul and james are going to delve much deeper into in next week's webinar uh, adapting pe so i think probably is actually a good time to to show you one of our our, our short uh, pe unit videos which i think will go somewhere to starting to answer this question um, but also link nicely and tee up next week's webinar as well so I'll just pop that video on. And again, you know, for, for everybody watching, if there's anything that, you know, you spot in the video that you want to comment on in the chat box, that'd be fantastic. Managing difference in PE. Step. Children are different from each other. They differ in lots of ways, including abilities, confidence and interest. High quality PE needs to recognise these differences by adjusting and adapting lessons appropriately so that all children are included and engaged. Typically, we need to work with individuals or small groups, just as we would do in a numeracy or a literacy lesson. A good way to do this is by using the STEP framework. S is for space. The game's space can be adjusted to vary the challenge for those playing. In knights, castles and dragons, the teacher, Ben, makes one of the castle areas bigger. I'm going to make Haroon's castle a little bit bigger because he's been really successful. So you've got a bigger area to defend now. Can you see it? There you go. Have a go. Good boy. A different challenge. I've made yours a bit smaller, so I want you to make sure you try and get into the middle of your castle now. So look where the spots are now. And now defend this area now. So have a little look now. Good. Useful task. In Cone Collector, Ben amends the task, 
for one of the teams to give them a harder challenge. You guys can now no longer play an overhead pass. I want to challenge you now. See if you can be creative. You can play a chess pass, but it has to be below shoulder. E is for equipment. In Cat and Mouse, teacher Amanda introduces new equipment to vary the challenge. Is it going to make it easier or harder by having a ball? Harder, fantastic. So we're going to have a ball and you're going to have a choice of what you want to do with that ball. You can either balance it on your hand. You could bounce it like a basketball. Or you can be super brave and put it on the floor and dribble it as a football. In three, two, one, Amanda changes the number of players on each team to play 5v3 rather than 4v4 to make the contest more equal. I'm going to give you more of a challenge now. I'm going to take one of your players off you. One of your players has been sent off and they are going to be sent to the opposite team. So can you take off your blue bib for me, please, and put on a pink bib to join the pink team? Yes, Pinks, that was in control. Well done. Write your score down. Write your score down. So, like I said, we're, we're going to delve much deeper into that next next week on the Adapting, uh, Adapting PE webinar. Just, just having a quick look at the, at the chat box. A, a lot of the things that were coming in were, were noticing that Ben and Amanda weren't stopping the lesson a lot a lot of the times and it was just making slight differences and, and giving a, the students a lot of choice in terms of the activity they did and you know a couple of people had mentioned it in not being a negative doing something different to other people in the class and it might be that you've got five ten different versions of the same game going on uh, within the within the class and it's not necessarily it's certainly not seen as a negative thing just just giving the students those choices so like I said, you know, if that's something that sparked your interest and, and you want to a little bit more in terms of that content, then certainly sign up for next week, and we'll give you we'll give you the link to do that at the end of uh, today's webinar. Uh, any more questions around engaging pupils that have come in, Tom? Yes, mates. So um, the second one is how can we engage and motivate less active girls in PE? Fantastic. Um, this is, uh, you know, it's, it's another great question and one that we're we're passionate about as an organisation, and you know, one of our, of our key priorities is is making sure girls have equal opportunity and access uh, to to enjoy sports, to enjoy football, to enjoy PE, and I think my answer to that question will probably be an answer back, which uh, sorry, a question back, which would be, you know, have you identified what it is that's stopping them being engaged and active? Because I think that's the key to engaging them, and if if we can if we can decipher and identify what it is that's stopping them being engaged, then we can start to address the problem. And that could be a range of different things depending on the, on the girls in your class. Um, it might be something as simple as as your PE kit, and you know, in schools I've worked in the past, this is this has been um, we've had massive massive positive effects to engagement in PE just by changing the PE kit. If the if the girls don't feel comfortable in what they're doing or they feel a bit self-conscious in the kit that they're wearing then that could be a barrier straight away to PE so that might be a, a, a quick win straight away um next question I'll probably ask is are we making the PE relevant to them you know you, as teachers you know the girls in your class better than anyone so what is it that they like doing you know what interests them um, you know when when they're in a in, in a group with the friends what what do they talk about you know what are they watching on television what are they listening to um what do they do at lunchtime when they've got some free time and you know if we can find these things out then we can start to incorporate some of those those hooks and themes that I keep going back to into PE and and start to hopefully engage them that way and the, you know I thought it was I thought it was a great question that came in earlier around the non sport specific curriculums that that you asked Sharon and I think the power of those you know has can have a real positive effect in, in engaging not just girls but those who might be less engaged in PE and I know certainly in the past I've been guilty of it in my teaching career where you know I might have sat, had a class sitting in front of me at the start of the half term and said this half term we're going to be doing basketball or football 
or hockey or whatever it might be. And for those who like that activity and that sport, then brilliant, that's the best news they've heard. I'm going to love PE for the next six weeks. But for half the class or some of the class, it might be a case of, oh, I don't like hockey. I don't like football. And straight away, they're disengaged. So, you know, by working towards a national curriculum and a non-sport specific, it might be that we're focusing on attacking and defending. And for some of them, they will be playing football because they love football. Some might be playing some netball games because they like that. Some might be playing basketball. For others, it might be a case of playing a tag game where they're still working on attacking and defending principles. But what that looks like for different members of the class, you know, is completely different. All still working towards those same learning objectives. And, you know, this question for me, you know, early years and, and key stage one teachers probably have the most power with this. You know, can we engage them from a young age? And, and can we make those early PE and sporting experiences as positive as possible? Because if, if we can do that, then that starts to create that lifelong love of sport, that lifelong love of PE and of being active. And that'll make life much easier for when they get into key stage two and beyond and, and shape their sporting futures, if you like. Um, another one that, you know, is sprung to mind is, you know, do the girls have strong female PE role models? And I talked, you know, in, in the recap about the, the power of those role models, but also about, you know, pictures on your classroom wall. So if you've got a picture of a footballer, is it a male footballer or a female footballer? And, you know, have, have we got pictures, you know, people like Dina Rasha smith Serena Williams, Nikita Paris, Steph Horton, you know, and, and showing them uh, the, the, these different sporting role models that they can aspire to be like. Um, and so I think, you know, we can't underestimate the, the power of that. And you, just to finish, you know, looking at some of the bigger picture stuff, are they, are they being encouraged to be active at home? And if not, can we start to influence that, that as well? And just, just from my own experience, you know, towards the beginning of my teaching career, I worked with worked in the school and there was a group of group of girls who were disengaged with PE and what we what I set up was a, a, a rounders club on a Monday night after school. But that rounders club wasn't just for the girls, it was for them for the parents as well. And it was brilliant. You know, we had I think we had three or four parents attended the first week and the, the numbers slowly started to grow. And by the end of the of the summer term we had like 15, 16 different families coming to play rounders. And you know, some of those parents speaking to them, they'd had really negative experiences of PE when they were younger. Um, but that that started to engage them. And, and and one of my, you know, proudest memories and proudest moments was driving past uh, driving past the local playground in, in the summer holidays after that after that few weeks and seeing one of the families out playing basketball on, on the court. And, you know, probably six or seven weeks ago, that, that would never have crossed the mind. So, you know, we can start to influence the bigger picture as well. And and finally, I know we've got a lot of colleagues from our um, girls football schools partnerships who who are joining us this afternoon, which is fantastic. And like I said, that links into it to to our priority to to engage girls. And um, I'll put some links at the end of the webinar so so people who don't know about those can can start to access some of those resources and get involved in that. Because there's some fantastic ideas around engaging girls in in football and PE uh, there as well. So not all not all those answers, and I know I've, I've waffled on a little bit there. Apologies, Tom, but not all those answers are directly specific to girls. But hopefully, give you know, have generated some thought about how to engage anyone who's in your class who might not be as uh, motivated as we'd like in PE. Thank you, Ryan. Really rich uh, answer there, uh, full of really really good points. Uh, so thank you for that. Thank you very much. Um, we're now just going to move on to the the next webinar. Uh, so I'm just going to invite Mark in to review uh, the key points from team teaching in PE, please. Hi, Tom. Can you hear and see oh, me? Yeah, okay? yeah, I'm good. Can you Perfect. see me all right? Yes, Perfect. everything good? Excellent. Um, yes, good brilliant. afternoon, yeah, everybody. So team teaching in PE. So this was only a couple of weeks ago, so it seems a bit fresh in my head. Um, so I'm going to um, quickly give a little bit of an, an overview of things um, and then... Uh, Tom, I think, has got some tricky questions for me. Um, what we did a couple of weeks ago, we looked at working effectively as a pair. And I think for most teachers, that could be 
um, working working together with another teacher, but more likely it might be with a teaching assistant in a team of two or three, or perhaps um, with a coach who comes in. And there's there's a lot to be gained by having coaches come in and help um, if the relationship's right. And we'll talk about that a bit later. But when we looked at definitions of team teaching, we looked at the plan do review process. So team teaching wasn't just about delivering together. It was about finding some time and space to plan properly before uh, a lesson or a program. And then after the delivery to find time to then review to lead back into the planning again. So um, it's a cyclic uh, design. We use it at the FA. Um, so, for example, during this the production of this webinar, we've obviously had time planning it together. Um, and after the webinar, we spend a little bit of time going, well, actually, what did we think? Um, and we use your, your feedback to help us with that. Um, the next thing we sort of looked at was the relationship. So ideally, as well as helping the children, the, the team teaching relationship will help develop each other. So in PE in schools, I think it's hard to get professional development sometimes. You might get people from SLT or um, subject leads come in and watch you do in a numeracy or literacy class, but it's unlikely you'll get the same feedback and observation about your PE delivery. So working together might allow you to um, recognize each other's strengths, talk a bit about what you want to improve, and then help each other get there. Um, the, two, the fact there's two or more people does mean that each child potentially could get more individual feedback as well. So there's lots of benefits of it if we can make it work. My colleague Chris Welburn um, uh, took uh, some time to present different ways, different models of team teaching, and some of them are up there. They are obviously classroom examples. We wouldn't have them all sitting at desks like that. Um, but it's the same in, in the playground. It would be similar things, you know. So you've got some ideas there of what might happen. And I'm sure if you're a teacher in a classroom, some of these won't be new to you. It might just be that you haven't considered um, what that might look like in the playground or the dining hall. And finally, this is our last slide of our, of our webinar, um, just looking at the top tips. Um, I won't go through all of them, but mostly that isn't about the actual delivery. It's the stuff around, it's the planning and the reviewing bit. That's what will make the relationship successful um, and what will really make a difference to you and, and your children. So I'll, I'll invite Tom back, who's got, I think, has got some, some questions. Just looking through the, uh, through the chat box, just encourage you to make sure you He's sharing ideas in there because there's some fantastic stuff being shared. So, um, so well done. Um, Tom, have we got some questions? If not, if Tom doesn't present himself, what I might do is just flick this slide on myself and, and see what's hidden question on the next one. Can you hear me, Mark? I can, mate. Welcome back. Brilliant. Happy days. Happy days. So, yeah, um, the first question I have for you, is up on the screen now. So how do you start an effective team teaching relationship? And I'm actually going to add another one for you, Mark, to deal with. I know you can cope with it. Um, how do you find time to plan PE together? OK, um, I'm going to take them in that order then. So how do you start an effective team teaching relationship? I think I think you've got to start with the why. Um, so let's give an example. Let's say you and I, Tom, are, are planning, are, are going to deliver some PE next week. And let's say you are very into the physical and technical stuff. For you, it's all about fundamental movement skills. You want to get them doing lots of stuff and throwing and catching and running, jumping. And you're really keen on that side of it. But for me, it's much more about them just having a break from the classroom and playing. And I don't want to teach them very much. I just want to give them some time to play um, and really focus on their behaviours. Now, that could work, actually, if we discuss beforehand, well, for you, PE means this, and this is what you think the children need, and for me, it means this, and this is what I think the children need. That could join up, but it's unlikely to be successful unless you and I have sat down at some point and had that conversation so that I understand where you're coming from and you understand where I'm coming from. Ideally, then you'd meet, meet together and make, make a compromise, but I think what often happens with team teaching in PE, and I see it a lot with coaches especially, is that the first thing they talk about when they're planning is, oh, I've got this really good tag game that I saw someone do, and I want to try that. Now, that's valid to have some activities, but I think that's the later bit of the planning, and the relationship needs to begin by understanding each other. So after you've understood where each other's coming from, that might help you as well, just determine what is it that maybe I could learn from you and you could learn from I, and and. and and that will help us, as, again, set up a relationship that means that we can both learn. Um, 
And then I think it's the national curriculum. If you do nothing else and you haven't got any time at all, then sitting down with whoever you're going to team teach with, with the national curriculum, the one pager, whether it's key stage one or key stage two in front of you, that will help you. It's there to help exactly this, to decide how you're going to do stuff together, um, either at a school level or a year group or you and the other year five class, whatever it might be. So the national curriculum is brilliant for PE because it's concise and it might help you be able to pick stuff out. Uh, the current context we're working in, I think that there's some stuff on that curriculum that won't be possible just because we, we will have to um, keep things simpler for in the short term. But the national curriculum will help with that. Um, so that's how I would begin. I'd begin by starting with the why, talking to each other about, about the children and PE, and then moving to the national curriculum. That would be the beginning for me. In terms of finding time, and I know this is a problem because I know it's, it's so tricky yeah. and teachers are under so much pressure in schools. I think that it doesn't have to be a face-to-face -face thing, especially if you're working with someone, a coach or someone external to your organisation. Then what we've noticed in the last few weeks and months is we can put stuff together online. We don't have to meet face to face. We can do it via email and WhatsApp and we can mm. ask questions to each other and we can record a voice or, a, you know, to, to send to each other. And there may be lots of different ways of um, of communicating, which might help us find a little bit more time. So I hope that answers those questions. Yeah, no, that, that's brilliant, Mark. And it, it's always a challenge, I think, when working with somebody else to find the time. And I think your point around having a clear why and a clear purpose and both agreeing that is is key so yeah really really good point there's one thing else actually tom that's just come to mind which which might help if you really don't have the time so if you plan a, a pe lesson this, this was something i learned when i first started doing football coaching my first coach education course i went on um the coach educator talked about a step back moment so a moment early in your, your lesson or session where all the children are engaged and they're safe and they're occupied and they're doing what they need to be doing and they're not reliant on you, which allows you to take a step back and just watch and go, is this kind of what I thought it would look like? Is this meeting the outcomes? Is everyone engaged? Do they understand what I've asked them to do? So if you can plan early on to have this step back moment where you plan for you and the person you're delivering with to take a step back and have a chat about what you're seeing and maybe plan for two or three of those during the lesson um because sometimes it's really hard if you don't plan it that it actually happens and all of a sudden the lesson's finished and it, maybe you've got no time again so you can actually do some really good team teaching and relationship building and sharing skills and knowledge during the lesson as well brilliant thank you mark um can i keep you on mark for, for the moment and um can i just ask you just to recap the very last webinar we did in series one which was around reconnecting through pe Certainly. Yes. So this was um, my colleague Steve Wade and Chris Bramwell, and they had a couple of their colleagues, um, Alan Dunstan and Lewis Keynes on. So those who were here a couple of weeks ago will remember. Um, Sharon's already touched on some of this already about the reconnection bit, but I wanted to put the lens on it from my own personal experience over the last few weeks. So like many of you, um, I'm sure you've got kids too. I've got um, an eight-year-old and a six-year-old, and, and we've been stuck at home for the last few weeks. And um, we always knew it was going to be difficult this time of trying to homeschool and trying to look after children while also doing full time job and everything. But it's really been much, much more difficult than I'd expected. Um, I mean, I'm a qualified teacher, but I still found it really, really difficult to motivate them to to, to learn and to study things. Um, even just sort of for, for a half an hour blocks or 20 minute blocks was, was really, really tough. And I found keeping their morale up and keeping their um, self-esteem up and keeping their um, relationship with their friends going online was, was really difficult. And I think when I'm looking to send, Hannah's going back, she's in year one in two weeks time. Um, she's already a little bit nervous about it. Whereas a few weeks ago, she was excited. Now she's started to get a little bit more apprehensive about going back. And I think all the children, as Sharon alluded to before, will be in very, very different contexts. Mine are fortunate. We've got back garden. We've got park over the road. So we're able to get out and do stuff. But there won't be all, all children like that. And I know you, you know that as well because you, you know your class. It's not like you, you haven't met them before. So you'll be able to already have an idea of, of who's going to come back in, in what frame of mind. But I think we can't... Um, overstate just how much this has had an impact on them as as little people it's hard for adults for them this is a big chunk of their life and um it, and it's been difficult so um i think we need to although there might be a rush academically to talk 
get them up to speed. And in, in, in PE, that might be that we want to get them learning again a bit. But most of all, it's that reconnection piece, which is the key message uh, that came through uh, in our last webinar a couple of weeks ago. Um, so to, to final recap on that is to come back to a word that Sharon used earlier, which was rejuvenation, which is a lovely word. And I, and I looked it up when she explained it to me earlier today and to find its exact meaning. And it's um, the meaning is to make feel younger, better or more vital or to restore. And I think that's essentially what these children need. So uh, from a parent's point of view, if my children go back and before the summer holidays, they get a feeling that they're more vital better younger and and restored that's kind of i think for all of us that's essentially what we want to achieve and i think that leads through to um what PE needs to look like over the next few weeks and months um so th that was the final slide from a couple of weeks ago i'll leave that up there but but the second uh, bullet point there seemed to be the one that resonated most with people our mission as educators should be to journey with that child through a process of re-engagement which leads them back to their rightful status as a fully engaged authentic learner um, it, really concise um, and poetic so I'll I'll leave you with that and I'll, I'll pass you back to Tom please keep the we're going to have a chance to do some QA Q&A before we finish I think so please keep the uh, keep the chat box happy if it's things that we've talked about that have um spurred something in you that you thought well what about this or if it's just something else that you've got in your mind then feel free to to throw throw some questions in and i'll hand back over to tom thank you mark can you hear me okay yes we can brilliant so yeah as mark just mentioned um we're going to dip into the chat box now and i know ryan and sharon have been eagerly watching it uh picking out maybe some key questions and themes so is there anything you'd like to discuss yeah i mean first of all it, i can just see how much passion is uh, is the children are engaging with by the comments of all of you on the webinar today so i feel already in a much better place knowing you're there out there helping these children re-engage with the new normal um, so well done, everybody, from me. Just uh, yeah, just just to pick up, you know, while, while Mark was speaking there and answering those questions, it, it did give me a chance just to scroll back up and have a look at some of the things that were coming in around, um, particularly around the, uh, engaging pupils, but in particular engaging girls. And like like Sharon said, it's fantastic to see the passion in the room because there's just so many different ideas that people were sharing, which is which is brilliant and. Uh, some of the things that have come in just as you know it was it was scrolling quite fast but some of the things i picked out uh harry and deborah having female athletes of the month and displaying them on the wall you know fun, you know the power of that just being able to see that for for a student in a class is just you know you, you can't put a price on that really um lunchtime leaders uh beth talked about and i know uh, just as I, just as i came back on i saw there was conversations around leaders uh i don't know if you saw that as well sharon uh, around using leaders yeah, and yeah. yeah and um to engage uh, like key stage two leaders at lunchtime to engage key stage one and early years and and start to develop that lifelong love of sport that we keep talking about uh andrea also mentioned that in assemblies using clips from women's world cups in different sports netball football uh, cricket and, and the power again of, of just the the girls in the school being able to see those role models in front of them and uh another thing that came in was around boys sometimes dominating not not always boys but on some occasions boys might dominate and be overly competitive or, or certainly very competitive in a p lesson i think i think that's a you know that that is a good point and i think it's going to link right back around to, to where we started the webinar with the with the stuff you talked about sharing around holistic development and i think that goes back to our learning objectives doesn't it you know yeah. our, if our learning objectives are our physical learning objectives then it might be that some boys or, or, or you know the more competitive members of the class might might shine through whereas if we have more learning objectives around you know psychological or social objectives around you know being a good team player or motivating others and you know being fair and if our objectives are based around that then it, it allows other other members of the class who might not be ultra competitive and might not have the best ability in the class to shine and uh, in the PE lesson as well. And I think that you know the power of engaging them like that is is priceless as well. Yeah, no, I fully agree with that. I think it's really important, but also as well, you can align to like you have to try a challenge you've never tried before. 
So even those highly skilled, you know, performers who have that physical literacy and physical competency, they, have you tried that before? Yes. Well, no, I want you to think of a challenge you haven't tried to do. It. And then that way you're still getting everybody working almost to the same objective, but physically stretching and challenging themselves by their choice. Yeah, I'd, I'd recommend everybody as well when, when we give out the links in a second to the to the previous webinars. Uh, Chris Weldon went into detail around parallel activities and, and the power of those for, for, for different types of, of students in your class as well. So I'd recommend going back and having a look at that as well. Yeah, good. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you guys for, for that. Um, I know it's been a bit of a task because the chat box has been flying, but that's absolutely brilliant to see. So thank you very much. Thank you. So, guys, um, we're just going to wrap up the webinar now. Um, firstly, thank you for your engagement within the chat box. It's been absolutely fantastic. I've seen uh, like a, a small community on there linking together. Some people knew each other, which was great to see. Um, we hope that you found this useful and informative. As you'll see on the screen, we've got more um, webinars coming up in Series 2 with adapting activities in PE effective planning in PE and the PE landscape. Um, my tip would be sign up as soon as possible um, because these, these will get quite full quickly. Uh, and please share these with your network of, of staff that you work with. And then I think Sharon alluded to it earlier in the webinar. So we're excited to announce that our webinars will be on the FA Learning YouTube channel. This means that you'll be, be able to access uh, all of our webinars at your own convenience. I believe if you were to go on there after this webinar, you will see our whole first series on there now. Again, sharing's caring, so please share these with your networks. Uh, it's worth pointing out as well, Tom, one of the handouts that I've just released as well is a, a link which takes you directly to that YouTube page as well, which has got the four, four webinars from series one for anyone who missed them. Brilliant. Thank you, Ryan. Um, yeah, so as you'll see on the screen, we've just got some further reading that you might want to access. So there's some websites there which will uh, provide you with free resources and hopefully help you plan for the future. As uh, Ryan mentioned then, there's the handouts tab and in there you should have access to the webinar slides, the certificate and the YouTube link, which will take you straight to it. And finally, at the bottom of the slide, uh, there is the link to the AFPI guidance, which I outlined right at the start, which you may or may have not seen. And finally, um, if you are on Twitter, give us a follow and you'll see our handle at the bottom of the slide. Um, that's probably the best place to see our latest news where we like to tweet. Um, and that now leads me to say thank you for your time and engagement during today's webinar. And thank you to my colleagues, Sharon, Mark and Ryan for their expertise. Thank you. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it and stay safe, everybody. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Stay safe.